murdered, dismembered, and decapitated. A hunt for a suspected murderer. Wanted in the gruesome case. A blood-soaked mattress. Another bloody package has been found. When I look in the mirror now, I just saw the little flaws just come out. Canada's most wanted man, Luca Rocco Magnotic. Eric Newman, a.k.a. Luca Magnotic. Hi, my name is Luca, and I'm a cosmetic surgery addict. With somebody, it's like, am I am I with a client here, or am I with uh, somebody who I'm caring about? It like my feelings are all right. You is know, it, though you find those lines blur between your personal yeah, life and your professional life. Yeah. Luca Magnata was born Eric Kirk Newman on July 24, 1982. His parents. Donald was 17 and Anna was 16, when they got married, and they only had him a short time after the wedding. Eric would then have a brother named Conrad, who was 10 months younger, and a sister named Melissa, who was 5 years younger. Eric's family didn't have much money, so like many other families, they moved around, even though they sometimes stayed with Anna's or Donald's parents. While Anna raised the kids, Donald worked at a local factory to support the family. However, at the time, Donald wasn't doing all that well, he was even later diagnosed with schizophrenia, which made him engage in constant abuse and fights around his wife and kids. And finally, when Eric was 10, his parents split up, after which Anna and the kids moved in with her mother. Even with all the changes in his young life, Eric's childhood was pleasant. On two acres, they had a large house with many fruit trees. His grandmother treated him like a prince, making other children and siblings jealous of him. And around the time the boys were close to school age, they decided to be homeschooled. Eric and the other kids in the family didn't see the outside world until the age of 12. Nonetheless, homeschooling made Eric feel alone, and things didn't go well for him when he went to school and spent the day away from his mother, and with kids his age. At home with his mom, whereas his strangeness might not have been noticed or might have even been celebrated. But when he was with boys, who were supposed to be his peers, it was clear they didn't have anything in common. From the beginning, the other kids made fun of him and hurt him. Being called a fag or gay, and not being liked. Being weird, he tried to be friendly and make friends with them, but he didn't know how and didn't fit in. The other kids would push him around and call him names. No one would talk to him except for some kids in wheelchairs, who were clearly not popular in class. On top of that, when he was made fun of, the people in charge of the class did nothing to help him. The other kids made fun of how he dressed and touched his hair, which he slicked back because he didn't want anyone to touch it. Anna was single for a while, but soon met a man named Leo. At least it seemed like they fell in love at the time. And a short while later, Anna, Eric, and the rest of the family moved into an apartment in Toronto. From all accounts, except maybe Leo's, this did not go well for Eric. Leo was mean to him and always hurt him both physically and emotionally. Because he didn't want to be tortured and put down by Leo, Eric never left his room, and never joined family functions. He felt like he was locked up in his own house. He did what he had to do on birthdays, holidays, and Christmas, but he didn't really care. He was nervous, and didn't like being around Leo, but all that changed in the days before his 16th birthday. Eric decided to leave his abusive stepfather, and move in with his beloved grandmother. He packed up all of his things and took them with him. In fact, Eric loved his grandmother the most, and he also knew that she liked him a lot, and even his mother was jealous of how close they were. He would call his grandmother daily as a child, and even as an adult. She understood him, and with her, he felt safe. When he was a child, she spoiled him. He went everywhere with her, slept in her bed, and sometimes she even dressed him in her clothes. During high school, Eric moved and went to another school. One might think this was his chance to shine, make new friends, or at least be left alone, but things got worse. He was very shy, so the other kids picked on him, and his teachers didn't care about him. Although he got in trouble, he never fought, 
or was mean to other students. Although he tried hard, he still cried at school. He didn't like to talk in front of the class, because his classmates laughed at him. With age, Eric grew up trying to be more confident, and fit in with the cool kids who were loud and brash, in ways he never knew he could. He didn't go to special needs classes because he had trouble learning and was getting bad grades. Although he did not always attend school, he never did drugs, or anything that seemed criminal. He was just a sad, lonely, and a little sick high schooler who was lost, and trying to find his confidence and make friends. He dropped out of school because he was unhappy, and felt like he was getting sick mentally. In fact, at the time, he was sick and hearing strange voices, but he didn't say anything to anyone. At about this time, he became very interested in Marilyn Monroe. He read a book about her from the school library and did a book report on her, and that's when he thought they were a lot alike. When he was younger, he thought he was ugly, but now he started to see himself as beautiful, and sexual like her. At this point, Eric began developing a new look. He dyed his hair blonde, and wore tracksuits and long chain necklaces. And finally, Eric started pursuing his dream of becoming a model. People were enticing him, and he was soon getting lots of modeling jobs and making a lot of money, and his confidence was soaring. Eventually, he moved in with two friends who were brothers. The rich family offered Eric their condo, and Eric started dating a girl. Besides coming from a very wealthy family, she had many credit cards with huge limits, and the brothers were opportunists who exploited Eric and the girl. Eric and his new girlfriend were talked into executing a scheme by the brothers. But Eric was only present while she was shopping for expensive items, while the brothers took the items and hoarded them away. When her father learned that his daughter's credit cards were rapidly being maxed out, he became furious and stepped in. He banned her from seeing any of them, including Eric. But he also reported the matter to the police. Eric was charged with many counts of fraud, and pleaded guilty and got a year of probation, partly because of how bad his mental health was. Eric's bail condition was to live with his mother. But Anna explained the situation involving Eric and his stepfather, and asked if Eric could live with his grandmother, to which he said yes. With his hands cuffed in front of him, Eric was placed in the prisoner's box. During this time, Eric lived with his grandmother, attended all probation meetings, and completed his community service hours. But after the nine-month probation, Eric moved back to Toronto, and no longer had to live with his grandmother. He tried to get his degree from an online school, but gave up because he wasn't doing well and couldn't focus. Then he wanted to go to school to learn how to sell real estate, but he didn't have a high school diploma, so they wouldn't let him in. So he had some low-paying jobs, but none of them lasted long. And despite the rumors that Eric had many plastic surgeries that year, it was very clear that he had hair transplant surgeries. Hi, my name is Luca and I'm a cosmetic surgery addict. If I don't have my looks, then I don't have any life. A revealing glimpse. In these years, he started being an escort and continued modeling. People in similar situations sometimes find themselves in sex work because they don't think much of themselves or have less money. Which was the same situation for Luca Magnata, who occasionally stole food and was taken to food banks to eat but it looked like he was finally coming out as his true self. So what is the surgery you're thinking about having done or the procedure? Um, well, it's gonna be at the back of my uh, uh, head. Can you tell me what it is you're having done? Uh, it's a hair transplant. So basically uh, they, they cut open the back of my head and they take a strip of uh, flesh off. I've had my nose done. I've had uh, two hair transplants, like I said before, and I'm planning on doing muscle implants in my pecs and my arms, so. You think you're a bit of an addict? <laughs> yeah, my name's Luca, and I'm a cosmetic surgery addict. But yeah, I, I would say, to be, out, to be blatantly honest, I, I think that I, I am, because just 
the profession that I'm in. I need to um, step up my game, basically, and that's why I'm having all these procedures done. He started doing webcam work, where he would talk to and masturbate, to lonely men, in front of a computer. He didn't like it, but the money was good. The next step was for him to strip at a club, in Toronto called Remington's. At first, he was scared to go on stage, but when you're poor, money can be a strong motivator. He worked there for a few months, dancing on the stage, but he wasn't happy. He wasn't making enough money for what he was doing, and how stressed it made him. He also acted in a few low-budget porn movies during this time, but they were cheap. I'm a big exhibitionist. I walk around my house uh, naked all the time. I don't feel comfortable wearing clothes. Just before quitting, one of the other dancers suggested that he instead act as an escort. The money was much more than he could make on stage or in low-budget adult movies. At first, he had between five and six clients a day. He made a lot of money and had a lot of fun during that time. He started making around $2,000 a week, which to him meant he was pretty much rich. Most of his clients were nice to him, and he didn't feel he was being mistreated or that things were terrible. He moved out of the bad places and into places that a person of his stature should be. Now, Jimmy, you're an escort, correct? That's a very unique job. Tell me, how does someone end up in that career? Well, uh, I was a stripper first, and, um, you know, one of the guys uh, who I was stripping with said to me, he said, uh, Jimmy, since you don't like being a stripper anymore, um, being up on stage, you know, it's hard, uh, you know, hiding that uh, profession. You know, cause people uh, who I would know would walk into the club and, you know, see me naked. Yeah. Even though I told them I did something else. <laughs> <laughs> hard to hide when you're uh, naked on a stage. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said, uh, once you get into something more discreet and, you know, you, should, you, know, you can keep your anonymity. Right. It'd be, be, it'd be an escort, and I never know what it, knew what it was at the time. Right. So what's it, like, what's it been like for you becoming an escort? Do you enjoy your work? Yeah, you know, I really do enjoy my work. Um, I get to meet new people and, uh, <laughs> all the time, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a people person, and, uh, you know, it just worked out great for me, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not staying on a street corner soliciting right. in any way, like I'm not a hooker, you know, like, you know, a car drives by, you know, $20 or you know, <laughs> something like that. Right. You know, I, um, I, I'm like, it's really high, high end, high class, you know, clientele who I cater to. Right. And, like, you know, I don't really tell a lot of family and friends because, you know, the stereotype that's associated with it, you right. know, it, it's just not acceptable in our, in our uh, culture, basically. Right. You know, oh, he's an, he's an escort, he's uh, a drug addict, you know. He's standing on a street corner, you know. He's you know, he's addicted to everything under the sun, right? Right, but that's not, not your experience as an escort. No, no, my experience as an escort, I, I've you know traveled all over the world. Uh, you know, I don't have to be a stripper anymore, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I get to you know meet like you know really influential people and uh, you know a lot of um, you know great people around the city and internationally, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know. Do a lot of like high-end things I've never be able to do right. in another profession. I get you know what the best part is. The best part about being an escort is um, I'm my own boss. I get to pick my own hours and make a lot of money. <laughs> At least in one way, Eric's life was going well. He was wanted by many. People liked him, and they indeed paid for his presence. Everybody's like everybody liked me. You know, when I went to go see them, you know, we all had a good time. Not everything was great, it seems. Working in the sex business is never fun. He was raped more than once, but he knew that telling the police about it wouldn't help. A client once beat him up and stole from him. He told the police, but they weren't interested at all. When he worked, he was mostly submissive because that fit his personality best. It could also be that most of the people who paid him were dominant or pretended to be when they had money. He'd be tied down. He'd get hit. People would insult him and urinate on him. Customers would occasionally videotape what they did with him and post it online, which he didn't mind. 
I've seen this other guy on a cosmetic surgery show, and he had on his forehead here, he had like uh, two little bumps in his skull, and they protrude out of his forehead. And he had his grinded down, but because he, he thought it looked like devil horns. And I notice when I look in the mirror that I have the same thing too, like one here, one here. So I want I want it taken off my forehead. And I'm gonna look at there, I'm like, damn, it's getting bigger and bigger on my forehead. Therefore, perhaps for a new life, Eric Kirk changed his name to Luca Rocco Magnata in 2006. Maybe he tried to give himself a fresh start because Eric Newman brought back many bad memories. He also wanted to be a model, so it didn't seem like a strange choice to his mother. He has been trying to make a name for himself throughout 2007. During the summer, he tries out for the reality show cover guy, telling the judges. Hi, my name is Luca. A lot of people tell me I'm really devastatingly good looking, so. But the judges did not choose him. However, Luca never gave up and he stopped by the son's office to deny online rumors that he was dating the notorious Carla Homolka. Most likely, Luca was the one who spread the rumors. Later, Luca's alias account on YouTube made a tribute video to Carla, in which all the uploaded videos were about Magnata or Homolka. Because of the small rumor of you dating Carla Homolka, that's, this is the thing that's... The rumors destroyed my life, basically, and... Um... I've been receiving death threats. My address is posted, that's why I had to move. Uh, I want my Pomeranian back. It was taken out of my SUV. I, I, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown here. My reputation is completely ruined. Um, I just uh, want everybody to set, I want to set the record straight that um, me and her have absolutely no connection. I go in to see casting directors, I go in to see agents, you know. They know who I am, you know, it's all over everywhere. I started being a stripper, and, um, and then basically uh, I went from there to doing adult films, and I'm not ashamed of doing the adult films. I have a problem though with people saying those to relatives, and now nobody wants to talk to me, I don't have anybody basically, and whoever's doing this, uh, you know, please stop, you know, you're doing a lot of harm. But Luca still keeps trying to get attention online by posting comments about himself to start rumors, and then using other profiles to deny them. It was also reported that he had over 70 accounts on Facebook, with different names. I wanna be taped, I'm just watching my show. You stop. Around that time, in Toronto, Magnata meets a 70-year-old man, who goes on the trip with him. They go to Russia, Italy, and France. He spent quite some time traveling around the world, and living his best life. But all that was not enough. He needs chaos. In the fall of 2010, Magnata's online posts got darker and darker. He puts a link to a video called Three Guys, One Hammer, on his Facebook page. In this video, a man is beaten to death in a very violent way. Although he did not make the video, it demonstrates many things he couldn't do. But it was not long after he showed how sick in the head he was, to the entire world. In December 2010, a video called One Guy, Two Kittens, started making the rounds on online message boards. The video shows a man with his face covered, putting two kittens in a sealed bag, and then sucking the air out with a vacuum. Even though the video was taken down from YouTube quickly, animal rights activists found out about it. And that was enough for them, along with the enraged people, to chase him down. Soon after that, Ryan Boyle, a former US soldier, who goes by the online name Save Kitty, starts a Facebook group called Find the Vacuum Kitten Killer for Great Justice. Based on how some users act online, the group thinks that Magnata joined the group under a fake name. When the group gets lost in its search for the kitten killer, they think that he posted pictures from the video, with the face no longer blurred, on a message board that the group uses. Early in 2011, 
a new online group of people called the Animal Beta Project, tried to stop Luca from killing more kittens. They thought he would keep doing it, and then move on to something even more violent. The amateur detectives look at the videos of kittens, and they notice that the kitten killer's furniture, and clothes, in the videos are the same, as those in other pictures of Magnata. Even though the secret ab project group finds much information about him online, it is hard for them to find out where he lives. The AB project used, exchangeable image file, data, from pictures of Luca posted online to find out when and where the pictures were taken. One harmless picture taken on a cell phone in October 2010, and marked with a location in Toronto. However, that never stopped Luca from showing his cruelty. More kitten killing videos went online in late December 2011. A Santa hat wearing man, is shown feeding a python, a wriggling kitten. In another, a kitten is taped to the handle of a broom, and drowned in a bathtub. After the son wrote about the kitten killer, Magnata shows up at their office to deny that he killed a kitten. The paper hasn't asked about him, and Alex West, a reporter, says that his actions were highly suspicious. West wrote, but behind the denials, it seemed like he was enjoying the attention in some strange way. Two days later, emails that, are thought to be from Magnata, are sent to the Sun's headquarters. Then, early in 2012, someone told AB Project investigators that, he may have moved to Montreal. They then look through their collection of Luca pictures, to see if any of them show him there. About this time, Magnata starts posting blog posts about necrophilia and sedatives. For two days, from May 15th to 16, people online kept talking about a new video called One Lunatic, One Ice Pick, that hasn't even been posted yet. And sadly, that was similar to how Luca used aliases to get people excited about the kitten killing video, before releasing it. However, One Lunatic, One Ice Pick was more than an incredibly disturbing murder video, that contained acts of necrophilia, and cannibalism. It was a snuff film meant by its maker, to be seen by millions. While he tried to deny it many times, the truth is, Magnata, butchered the poor man, mainly to get fame. Even by doing something pretty awful like this. On May 25th, a video called One Crazy, One Ice Pick went online. It shows a young man tied to a bed, who is alive. One piece of cloth covers his eyes, and another covers his mouth. He moves around a bit, but it looks more like he's just bored, than trying to escape. The man's name was June Lin. He is in this room because he responded to an ad on Craigslist from someone looking for, man on man sex, with a bondage theme. And the man who put up the ad was standing next to the bed. Luca Magnata, the man in black, had one hand on June Lin's neck, and with the other hand, he kept stabbing him in the stomach with an ice pick. A little bit later, the torso is shown, with holes all over it. At this point, it doesn't seem that things could get any worse. But it did. Luca then started cutting his victim's body in different places, with a big kitchen knife. And unfortunately, soon enough, the scene shifts to June Lin's head, which was cut off. Luca plays with it a little, and pulls its hair around. The video then shows a knife cutting off different body parts. He then turns the headless, limbless corpse on its stomach, and has sex with it. Once Luca is done making himself happy, he uses a knife and fork to cut pieces of flesh from June Lin's crotch, which he probably ends up eating. Then he also brought in a dog, to eat some with him. Luca then repeatedly sticks the neck of a bottle, up the victim's anus. He then takes off his pants, and masturbates with June Lin's, severed hand, to end the video. The next thing was on May 24th, when Concordia University student, June Lin, failed to show up for his job, and never got back in touch with any of his family or friends. On May 26th, a lawyer from Montana tried to tell Toronto police, and the FBI about the video, but the report was turned down. 
People on Best Gore, also tried to report the video, but later, police confirmed that it was real, and the victim, a Malaysian, was the same person whose body parts were sent to Ottawa. And very soon, Canada and the whole world were looking, for the sick man, who cut the Chinese man. And there were policemen all over the place. And then the detectives came to show me uh, some pictures. Picture in eight of an Asian fellow, which I'd never seen before. As far as I could tell, uh, the, the body was dismembered there, and they found the body parts there. Nobody said they found the body parts in there, but I saw them walk out with, uh, like, thermoses. They had thermoses when they walked out, and the smell was overwhelming. On May 29, 2012, at 11 a.m., a package with a left foot, was sent to the Conservative Party, of Canada's national headquarters. The package was covered in blood and smelled bad. It had a red heart on it, to show what it was. Another package with a left hand, was sent to the Liberal Party, and stopped at a Canada Post facility. The janitor of an apartment building in the Snowden neighborhood, found a decomposing torso in a suitcase in the dumpster. After searching the scene, police found human remains, bloody clothes, papers identifying the suspect, and sharpened blunt objects in the back alley. Surveillance cameras inside the building caught a person, carrying many trash bags outside. The same person was caught on video, at the Cote de post office, and so the two cases were linked. At 11.30 am, the police went to Magnata's apartment, banging on Anna's front door. At first, she was scared that someone was breaking into her house. But when she looked out the window, the street was full of police cars, and several Peterborough Lakefield Police Service officers were standing on her porch. She also found out later that a group of officers with searchlights were in her backyard looking around, perhaps for other body parts. She didn't know what was happening, but she could tell that whatever it was, it seemed like a big deal. The officers questioned her name and asked if Luca Magnata was her son. She answered their questions and asked if this was about the cat-killing videos that Luca was said to have posted online. No one even looked at her, and even though they didn't seem interested, one officer told her that her son is very sick in the head. Then the media went crazy, and many people came to see the hysteria. Reporters with cameras began to pound on their doors, in the neighbors' yards and even in the trees around the house. After the police warned them to leave the family alone, the media gathered outside to wait on the sidewalks, to see what happened next. And what happened was that the third package was sent to the Conservative Party, with a note that said, six body parts had been sent out, and that the person who did it, would kill again. On June 5, in Vancouver, a package with a right foot was sent to St. George's School, and a package with a right hand, was delivered to False Creek, Elementary School. Interpol also released a red notice for Magnata on May 31, after Canadian authorities asked for it. Interpol's homepage, featured his name prominently, before and after his arrest. The red notice asked that Magnata be arrested temporarily, until any Interpol could send him back to Canada. On July 1st, June Lin's head was found at the edge of a small lake in Angreen Yun Park in Montreal. On June 13th, Lin's family DNA matched the four limbs and the torso. Lin's body was cremated on July 11th, and his ashes were buried on July 26th at the Montreal Cemetery, Notre Dame des Neiges. The service to police de la Ville de Montréal issued an arrest warrant for Luca Magnata. The Royal Canadian Police later made it a Canada-wide warrant, accusing him of first-degree murder, committing an indignity to a dead body, publishing an obscene thing, mailing an obscene matter and harassing the Canadian Prime Minister, and many unnamed members of Parliament. Magnata used a fake passport with the name Kirk Trammell and flew from Montreal to Paris on May 26. The signal from his cell phone led police to a hotel in Bagnallard, but he was gone when they got there. There were porn magazines and bags for people who get sick on planes in the hotel room. He had friends in Paris from a trip there in 2010, and the police followed a big man to whom Magnata had talked. 
He stayed with another man for two nights, but that man didn't know who he was until after he left. Then, at the Bagnolet bus station, Magnata got on a Eurolines bus going to Berlin, Germany. Luca Magnata walked into the Helintelli and Internet Café in Neukölln just after 11 a.m. He was clean-shaven and wore jeans, sunglasses, and a black jacket with a hood. Kadir Anlaisley, who worked at a café, called the police to inform them that he thought the killer was sitting at a computer and googling the latest news about himself. Around 11.30 a.m., a group of heavily armed police officers stormed into the café where Magnata was being held down and handcuffed. Some people in China thought the murder was done because of the victim's race. They were worried about the public's safety in Canada because this was, in fact, the second high-profile murder of a Chinese student there in just over a year. The next day, Lin's family arrived at Montreal's Trudeau Airport. The Chinese Students and Scholars Association of Concordia University set up a fund to help Lin's family while they were in Canada. They also made an award in Lin's name. In Montreal, there was a prayer service with candles. The Canadian press called Magnata the Canadian Newsmaker of the Year, which caused tremendous controversy. I am going to... What's up and hi to all my fans. I just did what else you want me to say. Oh my god, if that's number one. If I don't have my looks, then I don't have any life. My looks and my body are my life. And nearly two years later, Luca Magnata's murder trial is set for September 2014. Even though the date is more than two years after the tragedy, that is not an unusual amount of time for a high profile murder case to reach the trial stage. The Magnata trial is expected to last eight weeks, which is a long time in court. In all of the courtrooms, the judge, the lawyers, and the witnesses have to be available simultaneously. On July 16, 2013, the owner of Best Gore, Com, Mark Marek, was charged with obscenity for putting the, one lunatic, one ice pick, video online. After a joint statement from the Crown and the defense, he was given a six-month conditional sentence. He had to spend three months of his six-month sentence at home. Magnata's lawyer went to court on June 19, 2012, to plead not guilty to all charges against him. He went to a high-security courtroom in Montreal, to ask to be tried by a jury. And on April 12, 2013, Magnata was charged with first-degree murder, giving disrespect to a dead body, distributing obscene materials, sending obscene materials through the mail, and criminal harassment. However, Magnata pleaded not guilty, even though he admitted to doing what he was accused of. He said that his mental disorders made him less responsible for what he did. During the trial, Magnata's lawyer said that Magnata was psychotic at the time of the crimes and, therefore, could not be held responsible. But the Crown prosecutor said that June Lin's murder was planned and organized, and that Magnata was intentional, aware, highly organized, and ultimately responsible for what he did. Magnata then told a psychiatrist who talked to him about the night he killed Lin, that a man named Manny was there telling him to kill. Then, it was found that this name and Magnata's Tremel alias were based on the character Catherine Tremel, played by Sharon Stone in the movie, Basic Instinct, and that character's fiancé, Manny Vasquez. In the cat killing video, there's a third hand that you can see. So, there's my son's two hands, and there's a third hand. So, you can't see a face, 
so it's unidentifiable. But Manny was there. My son had phoned me and told me. So I'm assuming that that hand is Manny Lopez's hand. The police should start investigating. They they have it right there. They can take a look. They can do something. I had a document folder uh, in my inbox um, when my son was... This is before the crime happened. And uh, he had sent me a picture of Manny and the police seized my computer, so they have the picture of Manny. I brought it up several times to our local police department that I needed my my accounts back, but they were all closed off, and Interpol was not willing to release what they found. On the eighth day of deliberation, all of the charges were found to be true. Magnata will have to serve a sentence of life in prison, but he will be able to get out after 25 years. He also got 19 years for other crimes, which will all be served at the same time. Um, he wanted me to do certain things on the internet that I felt were not right to do. So I didn't, I told him I'm not going to do it. You know, so people don't forget about him on the internet. Um, you know, create accounts and then um, add to those accounts different people and do a Facebook and to do some photos of me, get things out there, and I felt very uncomfortable, and I said no, and he said then um, our relationship is over.